You're listening in on an animated discussion about Batman the Animated Series with two experts in their fields. I'm Joshua Unruh, superhero scholar. And I'm Caleb Masters, your friendly neighborhood film critic extraordinaire from the Cinematropolis.com. And today we're going to be discussing Season 2, Episode 15, Second Chance. All right, Joshua, I know I've had critiques of simple title cards here, but there are some of them that I think are very effective. Mm -hmm. You know, I think Showdown a couple episodes ago, despite not being my favorite, I also was like, yes, I I convinced you of its effectiveness at least. Yeah. Second Chance is the laziest freaking title card I think I've seen on the show yet. I am so conflicted about this title card. Is it either a genius or terrible? No, no, it's not a good title card, but it is beautiful and on its own merits. Okay. And... Longtime listeners will know I am so here for all these noir stylings. Like the first thing that I noticed about the title cards and why we talk about them on every episode is because they're like the title cards from classic noir films. Right. I love that stuff. And this one, this one could have come right off of a James Cagney film okay. or something like that. All right. It, however, has absolutely nothing to do with this episode and also doesn't make up for that by being particularly visually interesting. So my conflicted feelings are that I know it's basically garbage, but it's also beautiful garbage that speaks to my very particular aesthetic. Well, you know what? I'll give you, I'll give you a point here. This is definitely going for a noir style story. Not a, not any sort of question. This is a very hard noir story featuring two face and Batman. So Uh, I guess is built on gray areas. Yes. I mean, he's perfect for the most noir takes. And this one, it does from that perspective present a very noir take, but it's not, you know, particularly it's not, for instance, trading in those tropes in the same way that bullet for Bullock did. Right. Right. It's a little under the waters as far as it's definitely there, but it's not like overtly hard noir. Right. And this title card really is, I mean, go look friends, go Google image search for like the title card on double indemnity or gun crazy or something like that. And just look and compare with second chance. They're cut from the exact same bolt of cloth. So I can see that. So based on the criteria we've laid on, on this podcast, I think this is a terrible title. It's terrible. It's terrible. And yet it appeals to me so specifically. Well, I see that hard for me to say that the nod makes sense before, because I didn't think about that when I was looking at it. I was like, wow. Okay. The gray areas thing. I get that. I didn't quite make the noir. I mean, and of course, I'm watching what this is a noir. A, it, the story. Noir stuff is the baseline for for BTAS. Right. So if you're going to really, again, trade in that, it needs to be amped up somehow and not be a subtext, which it's a subtext of Two-Face, of every Two-Face story, but it's still subtext. It's not necessarily a thing, like I say, like Bullet for Bullock or something like that. Right. So I guess this title card as a nod to noir of things, fine. But otherwise, no, I it's think still this, terrible. It's, it's a super lazy title card. It's still card. terrible. It's so lazy. It tells us nothing about the episode. It's, I, I, yeah, I think it's not good. It's the worst title card that I would 100% frame and hang on my wall. <laughs> <laughs> all right. All right. All right. So, Joshua, you know, when we were talking about which episodes to cover, you asked me, you said, hey, should we cover this one? And I said, you know what? I don't remember if it's good, but I remember it being really freaking interesting. And I'm so glad we went for it because this is act- I think this is actually very good. Uh, and I, I think it is up there with one of the best Two-Face episodes. I can't believe how little I remembered this episode considering how good it is. It's so good. I even barely remembered the coin landing on its edge. Like even that only barely tickles my memory bank. This episode is too good for me to have forgotten. It's a crime. I, shame on me. It, no, it's excellent. I, I think uh, I love how it nods back to the Bruce Wayne Batman relationship. Yeah. This is the this is the, the the foundation of the tragedy between to the, two the of them. point of an actual flashback of scenes from that episode. Which, like, wait, hold on, I actually want to get your take because you and I, uh, well, well, no, you just generally think as a storytelling mechanism, flashbacks are not good. True, they what need you, to serve the narrative. Do you think okay. this serves the nar- narrative? I do think it serves the narrative because it solves a problem that Batman the Animated Series kind of made for itself, but it still solves a problem. And that problem is that BTAS does not traffic in continuity strongly. And we also talked in just the last couple episodes that when it does, it's kind of garbage. It doesn't do a good job of it. And there is some of that in this episode. Boy, will we talk about the Batman and Robin relationship. But in terms of 
Bruce Wayne and Two-Face. This is, if you think about all the Two-Face episodes we've seen since the origin, you could forget about how closely Harvey Dent and Bruce Wayne were tied together aside from Two-Face so and Batman. It's been so long. It's not really the focus you know, of a lot. we haven't dealt with the fact that they were friends when Poison Ivy became Poison Ivy. Like we've left that friendship behind. And because BTAS does not traffic in continuity that heavily, I do think it's short. It's the exact moments that we needed to see to understand everything that sets up the emotional conflict of this episode. So I don't love flashbacks like as a whole, don't do them. But this one, this one is good. It solves a problem. It does a job for the narrative that we could not have done in any other way as quickly as concisely. Right, right, right. Well, it was very effective because it reminds you of how visceral that accident was and how it so deeply impacted Bruce and Batman. Yeah. You know? So I think that like casual viewers who just came to this and had Harvey talking about how good of friends he was with Bruce Wayne while going under, that's not enough. Like it's not enough to to sell the rest of the emotional conflict that's going on right. with Batman in this episode. Right. Great storytelling. Uh, the nod back to what was it? The half moon. What was it? The, the, the half, half moon, moon club club. Yeah. He references that. And, the, and that first scene, and that's where the climactic confrontation happens, right? Yes. It's beautiful. Like the track is laid. It's almost a riddle, right? Like it's almost a riddle or riddle, except that Harvey has no idea that Batman is listening. Right. I actually have a lot of feelings about Harvey and Two-Face and how they are no longer working together. No, they're not. And that that is basically Two-Face bubbling up through Harvey. He he doesn't there's no clue to give. He doesn't know that Their he's subconsciouses are talking to each other and they don't yes, realize it. Yes, uh, but yeah. now they're very they were working in concert, right? With the coin being the deciding between them. Right. But at the point that Harvey decides to essentially kill Two-Face. Two-Face, Two-Face is like well, we'll just turn this around because, you know, he's planning this kidnapping and stuff yes. without Harvey knowing right. they're more separate than they've ever been. Yes. Yes. So I apologize for that rabbit trail because there's one other uh, callback to the origin episode. Oh, yes. I think that the therapist that is speaking to Harvey when he's going under and talking is about, the same doctor, the same doctor from the from the origin. I knew she was familiar. Yeah. That's a good point. That's a great pull. Yeah. Yeah. She's not the surgeon. She's in there saying, you've done a very good job. You're in control of two face more. You're making the right decisions without the coin. We're going to put you under and we're going to remove the scarring that brought two face to the front. And then everything goes off the rails. Right. But I was like, that's the same voice. That is who that is. That's his therapist See, who has been his therapist since jump. See, and this is a great way that Bat this is a good example of Batman the Animated Series making a reference, a callback yes. that you're like, oh, look, continuity without it making us think about all the other weird things that have happened in between. You know, uh, I think this is a really effective way of following up on those loose threads from, yeah. from you know, 20, 30 episodes ago. We're going to get a couple more of those, right? Because we're going to have uh, Rupert Thorne being right. part of the origin is one of the two reasons that uh, that Two-Face throws up that smoke. Like one of the cars is registered to... Rupert Thorne. Right. Because we want to get back at him too. Yes. You know, it's still the revenge for Richard Rupert Thorne. You yes. didn't need that. Just like you didn't need the, that it was his same therapist. But for those of us that have been watching for a long time, that's a gift. And it no, ties and, together. Well, no, it does. And, and here's the thing too, is even though there isn't continuity in B task, I mean, there is, but there isn't, that Rupert Thorne rivalry is consistent. Yes. <laughs> Very consistent. In the same way that like the, the clock King or whatever is always, after always the after Mayor Hill. Yeah. This, yeah. this guy, Rupert Thorne. And like, there's, I, I would really love to do a big picture analysis about like, and try to time this out because there's always this back and forth between him and Rupert Thorne mm -hmm. every time. Like in, at one point, Rupert Thorne lost everything and they got it back. There's all, it's like a big, war every time yes. this happens so i think that's really cool it's got an extra layer if you really want to dive really deep into the, like what's been going on theorizing or you could just take it at the face value and not have seen any of the other episodes and it still works well as yeah it works fine it works fine. we we get what we need for that in this episode for that subplot but if you've been following along it's a it's an interesting payoff yes yeah and and it again you don't need it but it's it's very cool to have rupert thorne being like i have an entire revenge scheme ready to go I guess I'll just use it on you. I'll just show it. Yeah. It's not a great revenge scheme, but also Rupert Thorne is not a theatrical villain. He's so not I very, can forgive it. He's a, he's a, he's a very traditional mobster. That's right. You know, he just like, he, he's all about getting those results fast. Not theatrically. That's actually a note that I have. Every time Rupert Thorne shows up, he's really great. And one of the reasons he's great is that they retain that consistency. He is cultured and funny, but he's also a gangster. So he is vindictive and violent. And all of those things are true. Every time he's on screen, every episode, 
every time. I love his reaction, by the way, whenever Robin poses, oh, well, we know this was you, and he just starts laughing. Just laughs it's at It's so him. great. Yeah. It's so true to his character. And uh, yeah, that was a nice touch. And then also the inclusion of the penguin, I thought... I. I I don't feel like that rivalry has been quite as clear in the show. Yeah, I don't know. I, here's what I have to say about the penguin on BTAS. Tell me your feelings about this. He sucks. Yep. I, I think he's like sucks. largely he's terrible. He's very weird. I, th- yeah, the way they utilize him in the show, I think is very strange and, n- and never effective. Really? It's not very, no, very rarely. That said, he's kind of a throwaway character, honestly. And he really in has this been. show. He yeah. really has been on this show. Um, he'll be a little more of a thing after the redesign, uh, as the iceberg lounge becomes, a setting that we go to now right, and because he, he goes air quotes he goes, goes straight. straight right uh, and actually pulls it off better than anybody else with, he's not straight but right. he pulls it off better than everybody else has but there's one bit i like here with him that i think could have been a really interesting niche for him to fill which is cultured supervillainy right like yes. like he he brings a level of culture like no i would never attack a fellow rogue in his sick bed right and batman believes him Right. Not not because Penguin's an honest man. He believes him because that's who Penguin that's is. That's who he is. Yeah. And I like that idea. Like the only honor among thieves person in Gotham City is the guy who is pretending that he's still part of society. Right. 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 He sees himself as a rich entrepreneur, you know, uh, not as a <laughs> supervillain. Crime is a growing industry. Right. <laughs> right. No, 100 uh, percent. So I thought the Penguin piece of the episode was a little weaker, but, you know, it was fine. I, we also don't spend as much time on it. No, we don't. And I think it's a it's a great way to frame this as a whodunit. Right. Harvey's been kidnapped. He was about to be restored. Who done it? Yeah. Uh, and this of was course, a weak moment. Who would go for him in he, this moment? Exactly. And, and his, these are two reasonable answers. Right. Like on the surface, these are two of his biggest rivals. But I love how it sh- goes to show that the biggest enemy of Harvey Dent is to face himself. Absolutely. He is, he is his own worst enemy. And I think that the, the confrontation he has with Batman is fantastic. Yes. The coin gag was amazing. How he couldn't get it to land on heads or tails because it was magnetized. Ah, we have seen Batman used the coin against Two Face almost every time Two Face shows up, and I'm really intrigued at this choice to leave it on the edge. As a, I think that intersects with what Bruce Wayne knows about where Harvey Dent is as far as his treatment. Right, like this wouldn't have worked before; it would have just angered Two Face. Now he's at a crisis point where it really is deciding who do I want to be or how do I want these personalities to work together and landing on the edge would be maddening to two face and Harvey in a way that it never would have been before. This episode is really good. It's really good. <laughs> when it also was kind of comedic, him running around on the rooftop, chasing this rolling coin everywhere. Right. It was super funny. It's but funny. It, but and then turn serious yes. at just the right moment. Right. Like as soon as it rolls out on a ledge, you're like, Oh, Oh, this is bad. Yeah. Well, I love Batman says, hey, man, that coin's rigged. It's not real. It's not going to give you any answers. It's either me or the coin. Like, that's a really impactful piece of drama writing right there. And of course, you know, they fall off and Robin comes to the rescue. But all of that back and forth between them is so good. Because here's some some stuff I noticed, right, is that um, it's the scarred Two-Face hand that catches the coin. But it's the Harvey Dent hand that catches the ledge. And then it's Batman grabs Harvey's hand, right? Mm -hmm. I mean... You know, of the, the the unscarred hand, the more Harvey Dent side hand is what Batman grabs. Right. And he's talking to him about let the coin go, which is also like let Two-Face let go. Him go. And Two-Face does it and then slugs him one. Yep. Like he is in constant war with himself. I don't think it was a disingenuous let go of the coin. I think that was Harvey's choice. And then Two-Face comes right back with a two-faced choice. Mm-hmm. There is so much conflict. It's so, it's so tragic. In this two or three minute yeah. sequence that is also a literal cliffhanger. Come on. Fantastic writing. It's so good. It's so good. It's a noir. It's a superhero story. It's emotional because you're invested in a mystery. And it is a mystery. And it's a mystery that, okay, so uh, probably on this podcast, I have complained about the Sherlock Holmes trick of this dirt only comes from one particular place. Look, I've solved oh, a mystery. Sure. They managed to do that trick in this episode in a way that is emotionally a payoff because Bruce Wayne remembers Harvey's words from the beginning. Right. And it's just masonry dust. It's not super special. It's masonry dust. Pl- the, it's this thing Batman found plus this thing Bruce Wayne knows. Knows, yeah. Together that mm-hmm. lets him solve the crime. That is amazing because normally I hate that more than I hate flashbacks. But also, it's a great way to kind of parallel this like uh, dual identities between Harvey 
Harvey and Bruce met here, but Batman and Two-Face are meeting here again. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's just, ooh, ooh, great writing. There's a lot of, uh, like, like we square the circle, right? We finish the circuit. The whole thing comes around, only we don't ever actually finish anything. Because in the end, Bruce Wayne and Harvey have a conversation together. Right. But with, with the shadow falling oh, over, over Two-Face's two face. face. Yep. But he's also going back into custody. He is. Two-Face he- really won... He won the that. fight. Of course he did. Yeah, yeah of course. He, he always does. Uh, and, you know, he's like, good old Bruce. We can talk about the war, but Two-Face won that battle. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Okay. Now let's talk about the absolute bar none worst part of this episode. Oh, uh, Joshua, I um, this is going to be a fun conversation because every time you get mad about about the Robin thing, I'm always like, yeah, but I think I like it. So, uh, so actually in this case, my biggest problem is that it's wildly inconsistent and it is inconsistent. The relationship between Batman and Robin does not make sense in this episode. We have already been over and over the, not this time, Robin, I've got to handle this on my own ground, right? The petulant Robin leaving the car and saying, I'm just a kid that wears tights is not a good look. Like he knows what's going on with Bruce Wayne and Harvey Dent. He knows this. It's not a good time to be like petulant and sad. And let me just say from there, he goes on to be completely incompetent, followed immediately by incredibly competent. Robin is basically just the mule of this story. I mean, not just the story. Honestly, I'd argue with a lot of stories. Almost Um, every time he shows up, we've had some good examples lately. And of course there's always Robin's reckoning, but you're not wrong. Let me go look at Bane. Yeah, he's the mule of the story. What do we need him to do? The skeleton key. What do we need him to do in this plot? We need him to get caught like a mope. Okay. What do we need him to do here? Have a miraculous save of himself. Okay. What, do, do we need him to ignore Batman here? Or do we need him to go back to being that petulant kid? We need him to ignore Batman, but show up at the end. It's, it's, I guess it's less Batman and Robin that are inconsistent to me and more just Robin. Robin. It's all over the map. And the relationship of the two of them in this episode suffers mightily. It's not good. Like, it's not a good look for either one of them. And I think it's just kind of, it's just half baked. It's just half finished. They didn't put the effort into those scenes. Right. Well, it just felt again, like he's a deus ex machina. Exactly. Hey, how do we need you to come in and save the day? Like, what, what is the, he, he's there for the plot. Not really. There's not really a lot of strong characterization. It's, it's one of those things where I feel like we got strong, stronger characterization from Robin in the early seasons and the later seasons that are less. He was barely around. Right. Well, but, but when but, he was there, it was good. It was it was it was yeah. consistent. And yeah. then these later consistent seasons, at least that's fair. Yes. And, and these later seasons, it's just like, hey, hey, we need you to show up and do a thing like it's, it, and whatever we need, which, again, is we are going back to kind of our overall criticism of these, uh, quote unquote, adventures of Batman and Robin. Yeah, it's weird. What, what were you doing? I mean, when it's good, when it is good, I'm I'm once again thinking you missed opportunities to make b into something else that could have been really, really amazing. You know, like like to be a Batman and Robin show from go. Sure. I mean, clearly b is amazing on its own merits, but that would have just been very... When when it's great, you can't help but wonder, what would it have been like if this was the thing all the time? Right. And then you see this, and it's like, you guys don't really care. And and maybe at this stage, they're building to the breakup. Oh, they they, they definitely are. They've got it in mind. At this point, I'm certain. And this is... This is once again... It's not the best way to write it. No, it's b trucking in continuity badly. Sure. When they do it on purpose... It's bad when they're actually trying to focus continuity instead of just referencing things to give the world cohesion. It's bad. Give the world cohesion. Amazing. Two faces therapist. Awesome. Rupert Thorne. Amazing. Right. Oh, no. Let's start driving this relationship towards a place. Sure. Where they're at in the middle of the story drives towards the break. Right. Where they are at the end actively undermines the break. Sure. Sure. I don't like it. Well, no, it's really weird, though, because I think the idea is that they're fighting. But at the end of the day, they're still buds, I think, is the idea. That's what we're here for. It's just weird because it goes by line from Bruce, just like you're always there to catch me and his response of what are friends for? I mean, we just saw Bruce Wayne be that for Harvey. Right. So in remember the context of the whole episode, we just saw Bruce Wayne literally be both literally and figuratively be that friend for Harvey. Right. What else are we supposed to think? they are talking about right, this moment. Right, right, right. It undermines the eventual well, it, break. It's I, like, I, it, no, no, no you're, no, you're not wrong. And this is the problem you have with television time and even comic books to some degree, which is you always, the, especially with like the sitcom style TV, the status quo always has to return. And it's like they plant, they try to plant seeds. It's kind of have your cake and eat it too. We're setting up for this, but also it's not that big a deal right now that it's, you know, we're going to change it in the next, it's going to go back to the status quo for the next episode. 
Yes. And the problem is because we know bigger picture things that eventually they're going to have a real break and Dick's going to be Nightwing. Right. And the largest part of that happens off screen. Yeah. So uh, it, it happens. Okay. So it's one of those where they, they, it happens. They don't talk. They kind of, there's like, a, we're past the point the, that it happens the, the, when the, we're introduced. Y- yes, yes. Yes. And they allude to it, but then we get a full flashback episode, like towards the end of the run of the new Batman adventures. So, uh, and it's fine. I mean, I don't really love, a lot of the characterization of Bruce Wayne and Batman after the redesign. I think they go hard for Batman as a giant jerk in a way that they did not during BTAS. We'll get to it. Sure. Yeah. Um, it's just really interesting to me that I can praise their use of continuity in the same episode that I can damn it. Yeah. Right. It's very bad. Right. At this in one section. I think they're very still, good in the other. And I do think they're still trying to figure it out because obviously they haven't gone full continuity. Oh, but, yeah. but I do think it's not a serialized show. Yeah, no, but I do think when we get to the new Batman uh, adventures, there is significantly more serialization in those oh, yeah, stories. Definitely. And, and of course you have Superman doing that as well. And then that's and you have to, cause there's crossovers and all that stuff. Yeah. Right, it becomes right. a, a somewhat different animal at right, that point. Yeah. Right. Right. So here, though where i feel like they're they haven't quite figured out what they're they haven't got, gotten it 100 percent yet yeah it just so again we may disagree on the batman and robin like but, no, but, you, but, but the implementation here is but not the implementation great. here is just wildly inconsistent yeah. and yeah. uh as a narrative nerd that bothers me even more no, than i think batman and robin i think it's very reasonable <laughs> very reasonable all right, Joshua. So uh, would you say this is a must watch? Would you uh, how would you recommend? Yeah, uh, definitely. Uh, I, I mean, we're going to get more Two Face episodes. But if this were the last Two Face episode, kind of like we talked about the last Riddler episode was Riddler was Riddler's reform in actuality. But it works as a last Riddler episode. I mean, I would I, the, I, I don't know if you remember what the last Two Face episode actually is, but I prefer this episode. Okay, so, yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, yeah, definitely must watch. Uh, this is the Batman and Robin problems aside, this is an incredibly well put together episode uh, that really zeroes in on those relationships between Harvey and Bruce and Bruce and Dick and Batman and two face and Batman and Robin. It's, it's like a love quadrilateral all while uh, all framed through a whodunit noir story. Exactly. It's uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I take it. You agree. Must oh, watch. I hardly agree. Yeah. This is, I think especially if you've been tracking the other two face episodes, this is a must watch. I highly recommend and as always, Joshua, I think we can go ahead and close out the episode by talking about some alternate media recommendations. Now, here's the thing. We've talked. It, I feel like with Two-Face, when it comes to alternate media recommendations, they're starting to get hard. They're getting harder because we've already gone through all the obvious recommendations and we've already gone to like our B or C list or recommendations because there's enough Two-Face episodes out there. And there's a lot of ways for these kind of uh, multiple personalities or dual identity stories to just go off the rails. Yes. So, so I mean, once we're to the B or C list of those. I'm not going any further. We're not going to recommend those. They're probably like either really terrible to watch or treat the subject matter poorly. Yes, yeah. correct. Correct. So do you have any alternate media recommendations for us today? I do. And it's very on the nose because of all those problems that we mentioned. It's an actual Batman and two face story. Ooh, nice. So for a long time, you had two face showing up in Batman comics with us knowing about him being disfigured in court. In in the comic books, he was actually uh, attacked by Boss Maroney in court and was scarred up from that. He'd been showing up as a villain for a long time, but we never really got more than that. And at a certain point, we start asking more intense psychological questions about Batman's rogues gallery. And Matt Wagner, who is a writer you have heard me talk about on this show before, because I recommended that you read Batman and the Mad Monk and Batman versus the Monster Men, Correct. which are golden age stories that Matt Wagner retold into six issue things like blew them out into modern retellings. He did a two face story called faces Ah, that is about Harvey Dent coming right up against plastic surgery that would fix his scarring and hopefully heal his psyche. And in the process of the story, I don't want to give anything away, but in the process of the story, we find out more about his upbringing mm. and his abusive relationship with his father and why the coin and why the anger management issues. And the barest hints of this were actually integrated into the BTAS Harvey Dent. OK, yeah, uh, but sanitized very heavily for ostensibly children's television. Right. This is very dark. It's uh, so trigger warning for like child abuse and things like that. But Matt Wagner tells a good story and it's a story that really illustrates how the scarring from the acid was really just the last straw in creating Two-Face. Mm. All right. So uh, I struggled. With the, I struggled mightily with this one. 
Uh, but I decided to go with a whodunit story. It's one of those, so it makes sense. There's a lot of those. Uh, I just, one came to mind earlier. It's a film I don't believe I've recommended it on this podcast before. Maybe longtime listeners can remind me if I have. But uh, uh, it is called Prisoners from the director Denis Villeneuve. Uh, who also mo- most recently directed Blade Runner 2049. He also did Ooh. Sicario. He's uh, uh, an enemy. <laughs> he is one of my favorite directors working in genre film right now. And he's also working on the uh, remake of Dune. And I'm like, this is n- cannot be a more perfect oh, I got a guy. lot of feelings about that. Yeah, I know. that's I, interesting. That sounds like a bad idea, but if they were going to give it to a guy, he's I'm the guy. He's the guy I trust it with. So, um, And also the cast for that movie is off the walls, insanely crazy stacked. Uh, but yeah, Prisoners is a whodunit story. Uh, basically, Hugh Jackman is your star character. His uh, children are kidnapped, and uh, Detective Loki, played by Jake John Hall, is trying to fi- find out what's going on. Paul Dano plays a, a key role in this, who is a developmentally challenged individual. And uh, yeah, it's a good old fashioned whodunit story that's done in a modern context of uh, you know small town America mm. with ridiculously good production values. And uh, Dylan Denis Villeneuve is a longtime cinematographer. Um, co- uh, collaborator in cinematography, uh, Roger Dakins, who is one of the best cinematographers this working. Fantastic. It's an incredible film. Uh, it's also very violent, though. It gets very violent and intense. So, trigger warning there. It is a, an R for a reason, but it's a really good, uh, just a good old fashioned detective story. Um, but there's a lot of emotional weight that's, that's tied into that as well. And um, when I think about kidnappings, that's the best one I've seen in recent years. <laughs> wraps up this animated discussion. Caleb, where can people go to continue the conversation with you? Well, Joshua, you can always find me on Twitter talking about film, television, video games, and all sorts of other pop culture goodness at C Masters Talk. That's letter C Masters Talk. I'm also the editor in chief and film critic at the Cinematropolis. And we publish these in-depth essays on all types of different films, often time including science fiction, and superhero films, all the stuff you'd want to read about. And you can find all these articles at thecinematropolis.com. Joshua, what about you? I'm also most active on Twitter, where you can find me easily enough at Joshua Unruh. And remember that an animated discussion is a Pulp Diction Productions program and is 100% supported by listeners like you. To find out how you can keep this and our other shows in production, check out patreon.com slash Pulp Diction Productions. And in our next episode, we'll be discussing season two, episode 16, Harley's Holiday. It's going to be a real treat. Until next time, we'll see you back here. Same bat time, same bat channel.